Good day, everybody. Uh, and on behalf of KHL Group, TM Labs, and Crane Services, uh, Service Industries, we'd like to welcome you to this special webinar on how simulation-based training can help train staff and play an important part in creating safe workplaces. Before we start, I should introduce myself. I'm Murray Pollock, a managing editor at publishing company KHL Group. We publish more than 10 magazines in the construction sector, including American Cranes and Transport and International Cranes and Specialized Transport. We aim to keep today's webinar to around 45 minutes, and the format will be as follows. We'll start with a short presentation from Paolo Paoletta of CM Labs, and then the main part of the session will be with Dub Huggins, a crane operator and trainer with California-based crane service industries. Dub has more than 40 years of experience in the industry, so is well-placed to comment on the use of simulators in training. You will see on the webinar platform that, that, that there is an opportunity for you to type questions. We encourage you to do that, and we will deal with them in a Q&A session after both Paolo and Dub have spoken. You can submit your questions at any time, not just during the Q&A, and please remember to say whether the question is for Paolo or Dub. As I said, we want to keep this to around 45 minutes, so let me introduce our first speaker, Paolo Pauletta. Paolo is a simulation-based training consultant with CM Labs, based at the company's Montreal headquarters. CM Labs is the creator of the Vortex uh, simulators. He's been with the company for seven years and is going to speak about some of the commonly held misconceptions or myths that can surround the topic of simulators. But before we start uh, with Paolo, let's conduct a quick online poll here. You should see a question on your screen now. The question is, what do you think is the biggest potential benefit of simulation-based training? So now, if everybody who's listening in can respond over the next 10 seconds or so, and then we can have a quick look at the, at the results. So I'll let everybody who's listening respond to that question. Now, we should get the results coming up. So as everybody can see, biggest benefit, the most popular answer was better better prepare for the unexpected and to, to go through accident scenarios. So, uh, Paolo, welcome to the, the seminar, uh, welcome to the webinar. Any immediate response to the, to the poll results? Sure, uh, Murray, thank you for the introduction. Uh, actually, all those, those, uh, those points are uh, great benefits of simulation-based training, so, um, you know, not surprised by, uh, by, uh, by those results for, uh, for that uh, poll question. So uh, again, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Paolo Pauletta. I've been with uh, CM Labs for about uh, seven years in various roles. A little bit about uh, the uh, the company. CM Labs was established in 1996. Uh, we are experts in uh, simulation-based training for cranes and heavy equipment. There are today over 1,000 uh, Vortex-based simulations installed around the world. Vortex is the brand name of our simulator solutions. We are based in Canada and today have grown to over 100 employees. CM Labs is also ISO 9001 certified. So high fidelity simulation has become a popular technique for training skills in high risk industries such as aviation, healthcare, nuclear power production and heavy equipment operation. Simulation is a powerful training tool because it allows the trainer to systematically control the schedule of practice, presentation of feedback, and introduction or suppression of environmental distractions within a safe and controlled learning environment. Now, despite the high rate of adoption of simulation-based training, some myths still prevail. Let's discuss a few. Myth number one, it's just a game. So people who are unfamiliar with technology sometimes refer to simulators as just a game. Recent years have witnessed tremendous advances in computing power, networking technology, and artificial intelligence. These advances have fueled the development of high fidelity simulators for training skills of flight crews, physicians, machine operators, bus drivers, ship navigators, nuclear power plant operators, and many more. Today, simulators can accurately replicate the real behaviors of cranes and heavy equipment, including the rigging, cables, loads, and soil dynamics. With this, they offer real-world training and provide the objective criteria needed to evaluate operators. Simulators are serious learning tools. 
Let's take a well-established example. In the airline industry, pilots take responsibility not only for complex and expensive equipment, but also for lives. Simulators train pilots for non-typical events like machine failures and water landings, and pilots clock specified amounts of time in a simulator in order to maintain their certifications. The same can apply to crane operators. They too are responsible for very expensive equipment and play a critical role in the safety of everyone at the work site. In a simulator, operators can train to deal with non-typical events such as sinking outriggers, broken slings, unexpected weather, and other machine failures and worksite hazards. While most abnormal situations that can be experienced in a simulator may not involve threat to life or limb, they can address safety challenges and performance issues that would otherwise lead to production loss, poor quality work, schedule delays, or other such conditions. Operator performance is critical to both safety and operating profit, and it can be addressed with simulation-based training. In many industries, simulation-based training has been proven to reduce the learning curve and lead to proficiency in less time. For example, a study published in Chief Learning Officer magazine uh, demonstrated that in the aviation industry, for example, the same level of proficiency was achieved in 13.6% 13 13 less time for trainees using simulators. In equipment maintenance, the same level of proficiency was achieved in 60% less time where trainees were using simulators. So it's no longer just a game, and if you haven't thought of integrating simulators into your training program yet, you will be left behind. Myth number two, they're expensive. So some think that simulators are expensive, but the cost savings of using simulators can be very significant. Simulated machines do not pollute, they don't consume fuel, create noise, leak hazardous materials, nor do they damage people or property. Using simulators for training lowers equipment fuel costs and reduces wear and tear on expensive equipment. In addition to fuel cost savings, simulators can also free up instructors to focus on other value-added tasks because trainees can work their way through simulation exercises at their own pace. So considering the potential return on investment that simulators enable, their use is a means of cutting training costs, not increasing costs. Simulators are available for all budgets, from desktop systems for the classroom to immersive full mission simulators. Simulators are, are used primarily because they are cost effective, saving both time and money, while effectively achieving the desired training outcomes. Myth number three, it just doesn't feel like the real thing. Well, it may not be the real thing and it's not meant to replace the real thing, but simulators have reached a level of realism that makes them an indispensable complement to the complete and modern training program. Any machinery can be simulated from drill rigs, concrete pumps, mobile cranes, tower cranes, locomotive cranes, overhead cranes and more. Simulation provides a means to experience normal conditions in a safe and non-threatening environment. It allows exposure to controlled critical conditions that trainees hope they will never encounter otherwise, such as a fatal crane overload. Simulators can reproduce potentially hazardous situations which you can never do on a real crane. Weather conditions can be simulated. Snow, rain, wind of any, in it, from any direction, moving clouds, fog. You can change position of the sun to alter projected shadows. You can even train the lift team, a signaler working with a crane operator or two crane operators conducting a tandem lift with two integrated simulators. Simulators can be integrated to actual crane seats, crane controls, LMIs, and crane computers. The more advanced simulators use high-fidelity physics engines. This is a piece of software that can accurately replicate things like pendulum swing, boom flex, engine torque, and more. This ensures that simulator seat time results in real operator skills and not just controls familiarization. Simulation also provides an opportunity for data collection that is, uh, that is otherwise not possible in the real world. Data collection permits performance comparison, viewing a student's performance progress in time, or building performance benchmarks and comparing trainees to each other. In the end, a realistic simulation makes for engaging and effective training, which means better prepared operators. Thank you, and uh, back to you, Murray. Thanks, Paolo. That was uh, really interesting. Uh, we're right on schedule. 
Um, to our audience, just remember that any questions for Paolo, uh, you can submit submit via the, the panel, and we'll deal with those at the end of the Q&A. Now we move on to our main speaker today, Doug Huggins. Doug operated his first crane in 1968. In fact, he paid his way through college by operating cranes. And his entire career since has been based on cranes, either operating them, something he still does when there's a complicated lift to be done, or training the industry's future crane operators. He really began to focus on operator training in 1992, and for the past four years has been managing the training activities for Crane Service Industries, or CSI, which is based in Bakersfield, California. Among the training tools used by CSI is a Vortex simulator designed by CM Labs. Dub is going to tell us about his experience of using a simulator in his training operations and the place that such te technology has in the industry. But before that, we'll have another quick online poll. You should see the question on your screen, everyone. The question is, how do you currently assess operator competency? So again, I'll give you 10 seconds or so to, to, uh, to uh, choose your uh, answer. Let's see if we can have a look at the results. So the most popular answer is in-house evaluation by trainer supervisor. That's interesting. And um, Doug, what, what, what do you think about that? I'm handing over to you now, and you, maybe you could respond immediately to that, uh, the poll. Um, <clears throat> I'm rather happy to see that the majority said that by in-house evaluation by a trainer or supervisor, and that is good as long as that trainer or supervisor is familiar with cranes and knows how they're supposed to act, react, and what it really takes to be an operator. The only thing that bothers me is industry certification as proof of competency. Certification doesn't prove competency, it just proves that that individual is certified. And for every crane, you need to learn to be competent and you need to be audited and tested on that particular crane. That would be my reaction. By the way, thank you for having me here. Okay, Doug, if you want to carry on with your presentation now, thanks. Thank you. First off, I am with Crane Service Industries. We are a full-time training and testing company. We have classroom instruction, one-on-one -on -one hands-on training on the simulator and on the crane. We prepare the candidate for NCCO certification for the written and for the hands-on examination. We work very hard to make sure that they have the tools they need to pass the written, and then we work very, very hard with them to make sure that they have the tools they need to be able to go out and be a competent operator and understand every crane is different and they have to get used to that crane, but the dynamics of craning are all the same. We use PowerPoint presentation, OSHA guides, actual physical crane walk-around inspections, rigging samples, demonstrations in our classes. We give our students a study guide, and we also offer individual tutoring because sometimes students are going to have a hard time grasping on to some parts of what is trying to be conveyed as far as CCO goes. We teach at our campus in Bakersfield, California, and we also travel nationwide to customers' sites as needed. Operator training is not just about passing the test. It's about learning and about knowing the principles of craning, how to operate safely, knowing what the crane's limitations are, and knowing that each crane is individually different. It, uh, it's just like people, every crane is going to have its own personality. Every crane is going to have certain capacity limitations. It's going to have rotational limitations. And we try to pass that on to the student. Our mission is to train competent, knowledgeable operators who can go out with competence and contribute to safer lifts and safer work sites. We teach safety, and safety is a big part. When back in 2005, California determined that 
it was going to be required that all crane operators be certified. At first, pretty much industry-wide, it was a question of, is this really worth it? But as we saw certification come in, we saw crane operators go from lever pullers to really professional crane operators. And when they did that, it brought in a strong safety environment. If a lift goes wrong, it's probably not because of the signalman or the rigger or the site supervisor. It is the operator. The operator has the responsibility of the safety of the lift on his shoulders. It's why it's important for us to provide the operator with both knowledge and experience. And through the CCO program, that is what we do. We bring them to a point where they can operate safely. Root causes of crane accidents, inexperience with the equipment, not realizing that this is not the same crane that he might have gotten off of last week. Knowledge of the machine capabilities, proper rigging, proper setup, site conditions, lift planning, and we try to teach all of those as we go through. A lack of experience in terms of changing conditions, which we are able to simulate, and challenging loads, again, which we are able to simulate. Next slide. We can teach and we can push and do all we can about electrocution hazard, but until we get the, the, the student to a point where he realizes what he has to watch out for and how dangerous electrical hazards are, he doesn't take it to heart. And we have proven through certification that electrocution hazards has been greatly reduced. And we can even start to get them in mind of overhead electrical on simulators. Overloading, overturning, rotating the crane is one of the biggest things. Where are the most people hurt? They're hurt because the ground crew is hurt because of either electrical contact or because the crane's been overloaded and it falls and injures the ground crew. When the crane overturns, now the operator is in the greatest position for being injured or being a fatality. And we go through and very carefully explain that to the operators. The one thing about simulators is we can show them and, and take them into an overload position. When a, when a crane turns over on a simulator, nothing's damaged. All we have to do is reset and then let them go through that same lift again, doing it safely where they don't have that overloading experience. Craning is a hazardous occupation. We have critical picks all the time. We have picks that exceed 90% of the capacity of the crane. We have picks that are multi-crane picks. We have picks that involved personnel and all of those we can simulate and run through a dry run with with simulator to get the student comfortable with what is going to occur out in the field. Crane dynamics is one of the hardest things we have to deal with. It's what we probably more intently than anything else. If we can get the, the crane operator to understand crane dynamics then that crane operator is not going to go into an overturning situation. He's not going to let the crane be overloaded by dynamics. He is going to have control of the crane and the load at all times. And we use the simulator extensively to bring them into where they do have load control at all times. To maintain control of the equipment, you have to account for a large number of variables, including machine capacity, ground condition, power lines or overhead obstructions, wind, special rigging, and operator experience with load control. We also talk about weather. We talk about what is going to be involved. Why do we, why do we use a simulator? It provides 
a low-stress environment for operators to acquire basic skills and confidence. It allows the student to practice challenge, ch challenging lifts in different conditions. We can add wind and teach the operator how to work and use the wind to his advantage and not fight the wind, even create gust. We, we can bring in rain. We can bring in a, a dark atmosphere or foggy atmosphere or where the operator has to work in the blind and put a signal person with him and let that operator and signal person build a confidence together by working on a simulator and showing them they can get that load exactly where they want it to go simply by doing and following what they need to do, remembering crane dynamics as they operate. And it allows training during inclement weather or during machine maintenance time. One instructor can provide an engaging training experience to multiple students. And like I said, we'll use it with a, a signal person and a crane operator and sometimes make the crane operator do the signaling. And if you have a crane operator that knows and understands crane dynamics, you can make that operator an excellent signal person. It is less wear and tear on the actual equipment. And so our cost for running and repairing the equipment has been greatly reduced. We have had a reduction in fuel cost. And we have reduced the stress level for students and instructors. If I have a student in there on on the simulator, if he doesn't, if he's not feeling the stress of what might happen if he does something wrong, such as damaging the equipment, his stress level is going to go down. And when his stress level goes down, he is going to learn and retain a lot faster. A simulator also provides the ability to measure our, the skills of the operator objectively. Operators need to be able to perform safely, quickly, and efficiently. Fast doesn't necessarily mean unsafe, and slow does not guarantee safe. Operator load control is everything. It's there. It's, it's going to be for safety. It's going to be for production and machine longevity. It is going to help that, that owner maintain that machine because that operator is going to be operating it like he should and not dynamically loading that machine all the time. Of course, any accident or contact between a load and stationary object is undesirable unless you're placing an object. And then it is a controlled collision, just like an aircraft landing. It's a controlled crash. But the simulator gives us the ability to identify collisions as light, medium, severe. It allows us to go back and show the operator replay what he did so we can point out what he did right, what he did wrong, and we can have him make those improvements. And it provides information about the trainee along the way. Crane dynamics, part of that is pendulum. Pendulum swings are bad, right? Not necessarily. Every time we move the crane, we're going to have a pendulum effect. If trainees can control that pendulum swing in a second or less, they may be and are probably in control. If it takes more than a few seconds for them to, to get control of that pendulum swing, then they are not in control. This can be very subjective and hard to judge for a trainee, but feedback from the simulator when we play it back gives him a good layout of what he did and what he didn't do, and it makes it easier for the, for the trainee to self-correct. Going from the classroom to the real equipment, we have a huge gap. In the classroom, it's safe, controlled, enclosed, comfort environment, no rain, no wind, just an instructor and the student and knowledge to learn. So not a lot of stress. And when, when the stress isn't there, like I said, the operator is going to learn more quickly and retain it better. 
you take him out on the real equipment, it is the full impact. It's not he's not eased into it. It is just the full impact of real life operation. With a simulator, we can practice, we can hone skills, we can build confidence. Sometimes we'll even take experienced operators that have bad habits and put them on simulators because we can block out things that, that they are looking at and make them focus on where their focus should be. And we can hone their skills and make them a better operator. We can use the simulator for testing and determining when they're ready to go out. It gives them experience and we show them how to deal with hazards in a way that is not going to create any damage to the crane, to our equipment, or to anything around us. And so when they go to the real equipment, they have honed skills, they have built certain amount of confidence, and they have a certain knowledge of crane dynamics, and they have put them into use on a simulator already. <clears throat> a realistic simulator allows the novice to move from the simulator to real machines without having to learn bad habits. And like I said before, a lot of times we'll have experienced operators and one thing we, we might do is take the boom point up where they cannot focus on the boom point and they have to focus on the load. We can take them in on a simulator and get that done in a quarter of the time that it would take out on a real crane. And this means the learning curve on the real machine is less intimidating, both for the operator that has experience and for the novice. Realistic simulation is key to developing good habits early before even getting onto or into a machine, and it reduces the time to competence of that operator. An operator who is a known and reliable asset, an operator with knowledge and competence, and competence that knows crane dynamics, that understands and that has seen the results, becomes a better operator. Three attributes of a good crane operator, he knows what to do, he knows the timing of control movements appropriate for the load, be it a heavy load, a light load, uh, asymmetrically balanced load. He knows how to handle it and how to keep control of it. He knows his abilities and his limits, and so he builds on that and becomes a safer operator, and we have safer lifts. We use the simulator as a tool to make better operators. Yes, it saves us time, but it makes better operators. Ken, do you have anything you'd like to add? Well, it's interesting. <clears throat> you know, we have so many students that go through class, and you have a certain amount of allotted time. And initially, we thought a simulator would, would be a great way to reduce time, and it does do that. But being a school that's always striving towards excellence, not just teaching to the test, but teaching specific brain skills, we found that now that we have saved time, we can invest more time with the operator on the crane. So we have our simulation time, which kind of gets the ball rolling, and then we have our crane time. So by spending more crane time, we end up with a better operator. So in my opinion, there is no substitute for stick time. And a simulator gets us up and running quicker. And I believe that over this past couple of years that we've been using the simulator, we have been turning out uh, more competent operators, a higher end operator. I'm sorry, I did not introduce him. That was Ken Coop, the owner of Crane Service Industries. And so I'm sending it back to you, Murray. Oh, thank you very much, and Ken, thanks very much. That was a, a fascinating insight into modern day training techniques. It's time now for the Q&A. So, um, Dub and Paolo, I hope you're ready for this. We do have some questions. Um, let's start first with, uh, with you, Dub. There's a question here. Do you also train offshore crane operators? 
we have and we do. We we spend when we're working with offshore. It does take a bit more time, but yes, we have trained offshore crane operators. Paolo, perhaps you could respond to that as well. You're obviously supplying simulators to all types of customers. Is the offshore sector a big part of, of your business? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, CM Labs develops simulators for, of course, construction equipment of all types. Uh, we also do uh, a lot of uh, offshore uh, cranes, uh, port cranes. Uh, we do a lot of simulation for uh, defense machinery, um, robotics, and nuclear power plants. Uh, so yes, absolutely, offshore is certainly a big part of uh, of our uh, simulation-based training uh, offer. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, I think this is for you, Dub, probably. As this is a simulated environment, what is the impact in confidence when dealing with the pressures on a real work site? We, we use the simulator and, and show them the right and the wrong way and let them experience what occurs with the wrong way. Use the feedback from the simulator, the recording, and go back and show them how it's going to happen the right way. What we can do is we can build their confidence. I know that as, if, as long as I understand the dynamics and I stick with the limitations, I can get this job done. And so it builds their confidence so when they go out and they put their hands on sticks on the real crane, they, they have that confidence, they have that backing so when they go out, they, they do go out with more confidence. And so it is easier to, to get them to where they actually do move and you're not trying to push them anywhere. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dub, also a question here. What percentage of training time can you replace on the real crane by using a simulator? Some, it depends on every student is an individual, and every student is different. Uh, on average, we save at least 25 to 30 uh, percent crane time, but we use that crane time that we, we've saved to teach them other things. We go through other things with them. Uh, some students, we know what they're going to be doing. We can save as much as 50% and have saved 50% on crane time and then taking them out. And I'm going to turn the rest of this question over to Ken. Yeah, I, um, I love turning out high-end students. One of the worst things to ask us as uh, instructors is, how many questions can I miss on a test? Because I think you should strive to be 100%. So the fact that we have a tool that would allow you to pass the test quicker, I don't like teaching to anybody's test. We represent uh, NCCCO as our um, certification company, and there's a specific test or specific series of skills that you need to know. But I want to go above and beyond that. So when a guy does get to a job site, He's already thinking of how am I going to fly that, that load from point A to point B? What lever am I going to pull first? And when I pull that lever, what is going to be my correction move in order to catch the drip? So it sets up this series of thoughts of not just how to pass a test, but how am I going to fly a load? Uh, so in that way, the simulator is, is invaluable. We use that extra time. There is a time saving, but we use it for further training so that we get a more informed, a higher skill set operator when he actually gets to the field. Thanks to both of you. A question for, uh, for Paolo. Is it possible to adopt equipment simulation to a distance learning uh, environment such as a blackboard or similar? Paolo? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, you know, given the uh, the computer-based nature of, of simulation, you can certainly integrate it to uh, to uh, to that type of technology. Uh, you can integrate the simulator to to learning management systems uh, to enable uh, viewing of, of data in a more effective manner. Uh, so yes, you certainly can. Thank you. A question again for you, Dub, and it's re returning to this issue of of real life conditions. The question is, what about risks? weather, soil conditions, how do you simulate that in, the envi in, in that environment? As far as soil conditions, that is difficult to simulate. 
but as far as weather conditions, we can change the weather on the simulator at will. We can change the direction, the time of day, so we can change the direction of the shadow or where the shadow is going to be cast. We can make it rain. We can uh, so the operator has to deal with what is going to happen when it's raining. My load is going to get heavier. It's going to it might be absorbing water. Uh, if he's dealing with wind, is is it a steady wind? or is he having gust? And we can put all that into the computer so when they go out and, and we are dealing with them on the cranes, if we have wind, they have learned how to use that wind to their advantage or use that gust and, and deal with that gust and still get that load placed where they want to place it. So it's In fact, translate. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, um, you know, when it comes to to the impact of soil and different soil conditions, uh, simulators can certainly simulate things uh, such as a sinking outrigger, uh, which of course will put the crane off balance, and the operator will, uh, the student will have to to manage uh, that type of situation. So we certainly can uh, simulate different types of soil uh, conditions. Thanks to both of you. Uh, had you you had completed your answer, Dob? Yes, I have. Okay, good. Uh, Dob, another question for you, and it's a practical, somebody looking for some practical advice. How do you train a combination of experienced and, and novice um, operators using simulators? Well, with experienced operators, a lot of times what we don't realize or we don't see until we have them out on a real crane is that they have developed bad habits over the years. And so we take them back in and put them on a simulator and like I said, in about a quarter of the time that we would have them out on a real crane, we can reduce or just do away with those bad habits. We, we can shut certain things out of the screen and cause their focus to be in a certain place. And once we develop that habit of that is where their focus is going to be, then we can take them out on the crane and they see the advantage of having their focus there. With the novice, starting them on the simulator, they don't start with a fear. Uh, am I going to break it? Am I going to turn it over? Am I going to break something around me or hurt somebody around me? They, they have a comfort level, and so with that comfort level, you don't have the nervousness. Without, with not having that nervousness, they learn faster, they retain it better. Yeah. And Dub, is it? I, I think the one of the things that the questioner was getting at is is how easy is it to com, to combine training of experienced and, and beginners at the same time using a simulator? I guess that that becomes more difficult. It it does because now you have novices that are just learning, and you have experienced operators that you're really having to watch out for even more than the novices because their confidence might be, uh, they, they might be a little overconfident. And so it can be done, but it now, now the student isn't stressed, it's the instructor that gets stressed. Yes. Yeah. So, so your advice would be to stream the students into, into different levels of experience, I guess. No doubt. And Ken, what do you? Uh... Well, I, I think, uh... The hands-on training is almost a one-on-one -on -one subject. A good-sized class for us may be around the 20 mark. You know, you can give classroom instruction to 20 people. But when it comes to hands-on training, everybody learns at a different skill set. We've had people, you know, show good confidence and, and able to test out after six, seven hours. We've had 25 hours. It doesn't mean that the guy that took 25 hours will be any better or less crane operator, but it's a one-on-one -on -one experience to deal. Um, by, by pulling him out and doing it one-on-one, -on -one, he, he doesn't have his fellow student uh, commenting on his move. Gives us a better chance to evaluate him um, and then we can like Dub said pick up on the skill sets that he may be doing incorrectly uh, for instance back to this watching the boom 
you know, it's so important that an operator pay attention to the actual load. So if he's looking at boom point to indicate control, uh, he may be flying a load over the top of somebody operating a tag line, uh, which is a very dangerous scenario. So what we can do is adjust the screen to where he can no longer see the boom point. You can correct that problem so easy, but yet it, it's hard to do out in the field. So I'm looking for three basic things when we train. Does the operator know what to do? Is his timing correct? And is he smooth doing it? When we talk about dynamic loading, all cranes are, are based on static loads. In other words, what does the piece weigh sitting on the ground? As we start moving and swinging load through the air, it increases the crane load, which is called dynamic loading. You want to keep that to a minimum. Uh, timing, to be able to catch a load correctly, you're looking for that apex. When the load is all the way to the left, to the right, all the way in or out, so that you can make the appropriate correction and place the boom tip back over top of the load, providing that load control. There are so many things that we can speed up with the simulator. So I believe your best combination is training your students as far as the hands-on, one at a time. Thank you, Ken and Dub. Paolo, a couple of quick questions for you. Um, is it possible to train um, uh, as a team with simulators? And then secondly, what's your view on, on motion um, in simulators with respect to the benefits that has learning rates, skills, skills retention? But first of all, address the, the, team, the team issue. Sure. Well, um, you know, full mission simulators are actually ideal for simulating complex uh, tasks and, uh, you know, conducting a lift uh, involving a complete team certainly is uh, complex. Um, you know, simulators can integrate the roles of the crane operator, signaler, and even a rigger uh, to complete a, a single lift. Um, you know, when used for training teamwork-related skills, full mission simulators usually begin with a pre-briefing. Uh, during the briefing, the team members would discuss their mission, their lift, of course. Uh, they would assign roles and responsibilities, identify uh, potential problems, and establish a lift plan, basically. Uh, then the team would, you know, perform the simulated lift. Uh, the lift could be practiced several times with the trainees, you know, rotating through the various uh, roles. Uh, once the simulation is complete, the team members could participate in a post-training uh, debrief to identify lessons learned. Um, in many cases, in fact, uh, simulators can, can uh, simulations can be recorded and played back to the class uh, to identify examples of particularly effective uh, or ineffective teamwork. Okay. And the, um, okay. You, uh, the second question was regarding uh, motion platforms. Um, yeah. Well, uh, mo it, it depends on the goals of a particular training session and the type of machine that's being trained for. Uh, but say, uh, for example, a mobile crane simulation, um, a motion platform does make the experience feel more real. Uh, the feeling of movement in a crane, in an actual crane, it's, is an important cue to the operator. Um, if the primary goal of training is to maximize the transfer of trained behaviors to the real world, to the post-training environment, um, then a simulator should mimic the environmental conditions and the behaviors of the real crane and the real system. Um, so of course a motion platform does help to achieve that level of realism. Okay, thank you um, Paolo. Another quick question for you, does the simul simulator take into account varying load types, long loads, etc.? Oh yes, absolutely. I mean, within any given um, you know crane uh, module, there are uh, a number of, of scenarios going from ten to twenty scenarios. Within each scenario, you have many different types of, of loads, um, uh, many different types of, of load types. So yes. Okay, thanks, Paolo. Right, Dub. I think one final question for you, and the question is: Are, are the skills learned on a simulator transferable to the real crane? They are absolutely transferable. That is what saves us time. We, we teach them control. We teach them dynamics on the crane. And I'm going to digress and go back to the team approach. We, we work with a, a signal person and an operator on the, on the simulator where the signal person is seeing the screen, knowing where the load is going, so it is like the operator working in the blind, and 
it develops a certain amount of camaraderie and and confidence in from the operator to the signal person and then switching them around so the operator can see the other end and see what is actually going on and it makes him a better operator <clears throat> and then back to your question is it transferable it is absolutely transferable we we get them where they can swing and catch, boom and catch. They have different loads. They know that the loads are going to react differently because the simulator is programmed to where it's going to react differently. And it makes it very, very lifelike. And so when they go out on the crane and you put different loads on that hook, they know that they're going to have to act and react differently with that load. Thank you, Doug. Um, I think we've pretty much used up our time, so um, I think we'll bring things to a close now. It's been a really valuable and an interesting session, and I personally have enjoyed learning more about the role of simulators. And I think a big reason for that has been the quality of the presentations. So thank you again to Paolo Paletta of CM Labs and uh, Doug Huggins and Ken as well, your, your colleague at Crane Service Industries. Uh, for all the delegates, you'll be able to review and replay this webinar on, on YouTube. CM Labs will send all delegates a link to the site so that you can do that after this call. If you want to know more about CM Labs, then visit www.cm-labs.com. For more about KHL Group, my own company, visit www.khl.com. And the website for CSI is www.craneserviceindustries.com. So once again, on behalf of KHL, CM Labs, and CSI, thank you all for taking part, and have a great day. Thank you.